John Furlong, our guest, his book is out, along with uh, Gary Mason, Inside the Olympics That Changed a Country. It's called Patriot Hearts. Did I say Patriot Games before? Probably. Yeah. There's been a number of versions I'll get it of what right. there's been a number of versions of the I'll title. I'll get it right. Yeah. Patriot Hearts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Gary Mason, a uh, great journalist. Uh, did you uh, pay him a lot, or how did this work? Well, we we had a, an arrangement together to do. Well, first of all, I wanted to work with somebody who basically uh, w was a fan of the games mm -hmm. by and large. I mean, he wrote lots of stories about the games that were, wouldn't wouldn't I wouldn't call them, you know, the, the work of a fan. But mm -hmm. but he was a, a great believer in the games, and I, I think he was a student of it. And we knew each other, and so I thought uh, we had become sort of friends. And, and uh, I thought if I could convince him uh, to do this, and we sat down and talked about it, and we had to have a set of rules because he would be hearing things he'd never heard before, and I could just imagine him looking at me in disbelief, which he did many times. And we would talk about something, and he would look across the table and, "Are you what? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. How come we didn't know this?" And I said, "Well, no one asked." And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so we had a, a great experience. And I would say this about it: first of all. We designed a, a way to do it, and and he he was largely the architect of the process that we used, which was very extensive interviews, and then transcribing, and then scripting, and editing, and re-editing, and re-editing, and then more editing. And he and the deal was, it has to be the way I would have said it, and it, and we have to um, to to do it in a style that's consistent mm. with, with with the way people know me now. I don't mm -hmm. want to come out as a different person than people already know. And it was an incredible thing, and I have to say that over the period of six months, we became brothers. It was a fantastic experience, and he got stuff out of me I never thought I would be prepared to talk about. But like he did what? some. Uh, the well, pajama, you just you described the one. pajama incident. Yeah, what and also, else? Well, and also, you know, getting into some of the, um, the the political machinations we were involved in, talking about some of the stuff that happened in our boardroom. Because you know, Gary's view was that people generally will see this in a broad. People are smart, and they will see this. And if you don't paint the picture fully, two things will happen. Mm -hmm. First of all, the public won't believe the book, and mm -hmm. secondly, your own people, the people that worked with you will say you kind of went around everything. And so I wanted it to be honest. The, the last thing I wanted to do was to point at someone and say, you know, he did us a bad turn. I wanted people just to understand what it felt like. I have no right to say that anybody else did us any. People, everybody did what they felt was right, and they would have different views of this than me. But I wanted them to know, if you were in this chair, this is what you're dealing with and what you have to manage. What happened at uh, one of the saddest times in the, in the games when uh, Nodar was uh, killed on the luge track uh, in a tragic training accident? What was going on behind the scenes? Who told you? Dave Firstly. Cobb phoned me. We had a protocol for how, how things got escalated to me, and obviously this would have been one of those items. He phoned me and he said that we'd had this uh, catastrophic accident and it was serious and that, that Nodar was unlikely to survive was the f an early uh, mm -hmm. comment. And I, I, I thought, you know, that, that the next call would be the reverse of this, that our medical team, which the best people in the country had gathered here, everybody wanted to be on this team, this medical team, and they were all here, and that they would save him. And that would be the call, because that's what had ever happened to us in everything we'd have happened to us before. And, and the next call came and said that Nodar was gone. Um, I didn't know what to think, and I didn't know what to do. And I felt like it was a call about my son, John, who had been killed, and, and I was lost, to be honest. And I closed the door to think. and. I tried to think about the tragedies in my own life and what my responsibility was and what the country would expect of us. And there's a lot of pressure there. And, and I really thought that day that Canada will expect us to respond to this with the greatest of dignity. Then there's dealing with Nodar's family, uh, trying to understand what happened, the track uh, issues that would probably come up now, and, and, and then going to deal with the IOC and their protocols and finding strength. And Because I knew that at that very moment, the 50,000 people that were wearing jackets that were out there pouring their heart and soul into this would be very badly wounded by this mm -hmm. and to deal with try, all of that. That was the initial thing, and then I tried uh, to walk my way through this and and watch everything that was going on and make sure that this was a day where we were not finessing anything, that we were ruling with our hearts and trying to do what was right. And it was an incredibly long and difficult and painful day. And, and I try not to point fingers at anybody, but just to simply express our, our, our great regret and uh, try it at the opening ceremonies mm -hmm. to show the, the, the proper response for the country. And, and it was a, it was a, it was a probably I would say all things considered, and I've had plenty of tragedy in my life, the worst morning I've ever experienced. And you considered uh, so many things in preparation. I know uh, mustard gas, terrorism, 
plane crashes, uh, everything. Uh, yeah. Worst case scenario, what could happen? Never this. Yeah, and what happened was in the build up to the games, through every one of these areas, we tried to reduce every possibility for such a thing of any kind. And we worked with all agencies to do this. And we had a full safety department at Vanock that looked at everything. And our team had gone through, I mean, one of the exercises that you go through in the last year before the games is wreaking havoc on yourself because you're trying to figure out how will we, I remember one day, you know, we our technology team is up on Whistler Mountain. We're running an event and, and uh, they're up there doing all of the timing and scoring and everything and another team is up there pulling wires out of the wall and seeing how they're going to respond when things are going mm -hmm. bad and we, we were, that's the kind of company we were. So we were going through that uh, very difficult exercise on, on the, the lead into the games to be ready for anything but more to try to make sure we didn't actually have to deal with anything. Sure. And you did send an email uh, according to the papers uh, earlier uh, suggesting that uh, we have to make sure the lose track is safe and if the lose of the Federation is concerned and the athletes are concerned. What was that about? Well, this letter we got was a letter that the Luge Federation had sent to their designer about the Sochi track, and he made mm. a comment about the fact that, they, that he hadn't met his obligation on speed, just on speed, for our track. And so they copied us on this letter, and it came to my desk, and although it was, it was, we weren't even the subject of the letter, I just read it and I thought, well, is he saying anything here? You know, what, what am I supposed to read from this? And I could have just sort of left the letter because it was directed to another agency. Mm -hmm. But I looked at it and I said to my team, you know, is there an implication? I mean, I, I'm just trying to read what he's saying sure. and let's review this. And the answer that came back from our team is there's nothing new for us to do. We're already doing it because five months before this, we had received the track from the construction team and we were working with the sports to prepare it for the games. And we were, this is a year before before the games and then as we worked with them all the way through and they tested it and retested it, there was 30,000 practice runs on the track, they declared the track ready and they were the only ones who could. We had no expertise in this area. Exactly and as you know if you're setting a downhill course the ski federation is there and the yeah. skiers are there and they want it tough and they want it fast Yes. and somebody has to stand Aside. Well, you have to go into that environment to understand it because mm -hmm. that's exactly what the organizers, so they will come to you, the skiers, and they'll say, raise that mogul there, lower that one, and we will do it because that's, they're mm -hmm. the technical experts and they did this for the track sure. as well. And then the racers are talking behind your back. Yes, <laughs> yes they are. Alexandre Bilodeau, a great moment, first Canadian to win gold on home soil. Can you still grab the thrill of that? Yes. I remember the, actually how I saw it because I was walking into the stadium to see Jennifer Heil get her medal mm. on, the, on that stage and there's this big gathering around a TV in the stadium and it was like bone chilling silence. People were like holding their breasts and I wondered, you know, what's going on? Something happened? We go over there and it's his time to come down and, and he's on his way down and you can hear the ooing and oing and up he goes and he's twisting and turning and bang! And everyone went, it's gold, it's gold. He hadn't, he hadn't even scored him yet. <laughs> And I thought, what a moment. Not only is it gold, but what a guy to give it to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, he lifted everybody's spirits by, you know, a sure. thousand percent. And then Jennifer Heil gets her silver medal, and four or five times the number of people who watched the Stanley Cup final on TV watched it on television, which said that, you know, the country mm -hmm. was engaged. And, it was, and uh, Joanne Rochette, who could forget. It's, it's so funny uh, when I was reading this book, because I, not that the book's funny, but I didn't realize I remembered so much. Yeah. And I thought, oh my gosh, where was I when that happened? Yeah, yeah the cauldron. Yeah. Mm hmm. The, which, what, what when it was lit up. Oh, when it, well, what, you mean in the stadium? In there. Oh, yeah. Well, now it's yeah, here. Yeah, no, well, exactly. when, it, when it happened in there, it was quite interesting because this cauldron was a secret. And it was the big iconic piece for that no, because when you walked into the stadium, you're well, where's the cauldron? And it was underneath the ground. And it, they'd actually seen it earlier because it was these totem poles in disguise. And so when they went back in the ground and everything was done, because uh, David Atkins, the producer, he had tested this during the night because no one was ever supposed to see right. this. So they would clear the stadium mm -hmm. out and it always worked. So I'm looking there and, and uh, even Wayne Gretzky didn't know who the other lighters were. I mean, it, it was very, very secretive because yeah. we didn't want to leak. It would have ruined it. And we're standing there and I'm looking down at the floor and realizing something's off and the floor is frozen. Well, every two seconds was like an hour to me mm -hmm. and I was dying and I thought, my goodness, this is really a metaphor for the day that we've just mm -hmm. had. And David Atkins, I know, who's like five foot nothing, is exploding right. inside his heart up there and thinking, oh my God. A highly organized Australian, yes, that guy. talking uh, to these people. How about the day he said to you, uh, do you think this Rick Hansen guy can make it up <laughs> the ramp? I know, and I said, he said to me, you know, it's, we're not doing it. It's not going to work. Creatively, 
it won't work and he can't make it. And I said, you don't know this guy. And he said, no, no. I'm and he said to me, I am fit, John. I'd, I am fit and I've tried it. I'm going to tell you, it took everything I had in my body to get up there. And I went, I'll tell you what, I don't have this courage, you think, you, you, to call Rick Hansen and say there's something he can't do. Mm -hmm. So I said, please, David, humor me here. Bring him down and let him try. And I know what's going to happen. He's down there. First go, Hansen mm -hmm. comes around the corner and, you know, Rick pounding sure. away and up he goes. And he's down. And Rick knows very well what's going on in, in mm -hmm. here. And David goes to a corner, he picks up the phone, he said, I thought I'd seen okay. everything. This is not only sure. great, he's great. What did you tell him? He got to the top of the Great Wall of China. Yeah, I did. But I did. You did. I said, and you just don't know who this guy is. Imagine you making the call. Uh, Rick, um, sorry. Yeah, it's not You're within out. your ability, Rick. Mm -hmm. the, what he was did saying. you argue about whether or not uh, Gretzky should uh, be brought in a chopper or well, in I the back a of chopper. a pickup? I wanted a chopper because I thought the imagery uh, would be unforgettable, you know. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like flying, but I thought he would, <laughs> right. we could maybe give him an extra, you know, mm -hmm. aspirin or something and he would do it. But he, I just thought if we, if we put him into a basket and we brought him out over the water and around and, and brought him down, it would mm -hmm. just be a wonderful picture. And I thought the pickup truck was a little too Canadian, but, <laughs> you know, David uh, was worried about time and speed and he thought the sure. TV companies, I said, the TV companies are going nowhere if Wayne Gretzky's in a basket. But it, we didn't, uh, in the end, uh, do it right. that way, and Wayne went off. And of course, mm -hmm. he gave the people on the street who weren't at the ceremonies a great moment to see him running down there and uh, with a, in, the, in the back of the pickup, and, and it turned out fine. But mm -hmm. it was. Uh, what have you done with all the souvenirs? Where well, are they? They're sold. <laughs> of course they are. Oh, eBay, <laughs> Craigslist. They're all sold. Oh, really? you mean the stuff we had left? Yeah. Well, a lot of it will be in museums, you know, and there are medals all over the country in art galleries and museums. Sure. And there's and there's uh, there'll be a museum. Our museum here will have plenty, mm -hmm. and the others across the but country. But what about have. you? The gifts and the. Do you have your torch somewhere? Yes, I, I have a torch, um, which was given to me because I didn't write, really. I, the only piece of the relay I participated in was for for our own staff, because mm -hmm. I thought, you know, if I run in the relay, someone else doesn't get to go, sure. and and so I didn't I didn't do it. But I I, I just thought it, it's just too big a moment to take from someone else, and so I didn't do that. But I have some of those things, and I look at them, and and but I have not put the disc for the opening and closing ceremonies mm. in my machine yet. I haven't seen them. You haven't seen and them? I'm not able to watch because the emotions were so heavy that day. I just, I'm not able to. And even reading the book, you know, I read the first piece, the introduction, and I put it down and it, it my yeah. eyes water up and well, I, it's going to take time. Yeah, you're I have Irish. Irish. Those yeah. Irish, you got to watch them. Uh, uh, I always read the end of a book and you've said in the acknowledgments to mom and dad, wherever you are, I thank you for your sacrifices, your example for teaching me. Uh, you thank uh, Catherine Bachon, yep. who demonstrated in a thousand ways. Hers is a patriot heart. Thank you so much. Who is yeah, she? She was my best friend through all this process mm. and encouraged me to do this. And, and uh, she was a, a student of the Games, worked with us for a while, and then worked for the Canadian Olympic Committee, and just was a person that became my best friend through this and just supported me. And, and really, I think, in many ways, gave me the sort of last push to do the book. And was and did a, a lot of the uh, research and pointed to a lot of the things that should mm. be included in it. And okay. she's a great Canadian. To Catherine and the Canadian spirit, it says in the front. Yeah. So, uh, Vancouver Board of Trade lunch tomorrow, keynote celebration pancake breakfast Saturday, keynote. Yep. You got some speaking to do. Yep. Uh, official yep. cauldron lighting will be twelve o'clock here. Yep. And Sunday, February thirteenth, in Whistler. Yep. Oh, well, nice you. to see you. Yeah, great Thank pleasure. you for Thank writing you. this. And thank you for reading it. Mm -hmm. It was a fun read. Patriot Hearts, John Furlong with Gary Mason.